Good morning, good afternoon, and happy Thanksgiving to anyone from the United States, whether you're watching this live or, or on catch up. My name is Tim Fairhurst from Mitoa, and I'm joined by my colleague Simon and also uh, with Marie Eva. Uh, we are going to just give people 30 odd seconds to, to join, and then I'll say a little bit more. But thank you for joining us. Okay, I can see there are quite a good number of participants who've joined us, so I, I will start with the introduction and uh, those of you who missed the first words, this session will be recorded, um, so you can come back and hear any of it. I'd like to draw your attention to the functions of the platform, for those of you who've not used it. There are two things for participants to look at. One is the chat function, and we'll be monitoring questions and comments as the uh, event proceeds, please keep them as short as possible and that will improve the chances of us reading them. We've got a lot of content to cover this afternoon, so apologies in advance if you don't uh, hear us talk about the question you raise. This is only the first webinar on this particular set of topics that we're running, uh, particularly with regard to the new border formalities that will be in place in Europe in 2023 and beyond. So don't worry if some of this is quite hard to digest to begin with. There's plenty of information on the website, as Simon will show you uh, in, in 10 minutes or so. Uh, and, and this will be the first of no doubt quite a few to uh, webinars we have on, on this topic. So there's a chat function. Uh, there's also a Q&A function. Uh, and our colleague Sophie, who's behind the scenes, running our webinars as ever, we'll try and handle any, any uh, background questions you might have as well, or direct you to use the chat if she thinks the question's better addressed to us. So without further ado, I'm going to start, um, and the way this webinar is going to work is that the first 10 minutes or so will be a presentation based on the visa processing survey that Itoa has recently closed uh, and we've started to do the initial analysis and we wanted to share some initial findings uh, ahead of a much more detailed report we would plan to publish in the new year. So because that's a, a sort of set piece, I will walk through uh, about eight slides or so, give you those headlines. We will also share that uh, document so you don't need to take notes or pictures. If uh, Please feel free if you wish. After that's concluded, uh, Essentially, we're going on, going on to the bit of the webinar that will focus on the uh, entry exit system, EES, then ETIAS, which is the new visa waiver system to be introduced in Europe. And we'll go into some specifics that affect the UK or people traveling to the UK after that. So that's the menu of the next 58 minutes or so. Uh, so without further ado, um, Simon and Marie-Yves, if you could just sit back, enjoy, a uh, glass of water while I will try and get through the initial visa presentation uh, reasonably quickly. So uh, I will start that now. So let me just share my screen. We uh, have done quite a bit of work on visas in the past. The last uh, results are published on our website in 2019 of a survey we did four years ago uh, in late 2018. So we've got a good pre-pandemic snapshot and we've got a post-pandemic snapshot. And the news is not encouraging, I'm afraid, for those of us who would uh, like Europe to be a very welcoming destination. Uh, so some details. The people who responded to the survey were operators, so people who are selling to other operators or directly to consumers, agents of all kinds, so travel agents as well as visa agents, and most of them were in Asian outbound markets. Some of those, particularly the B2B operators, would be in Europe. Uh, the markets we were focusing on were China, India, Indonesia, Philippines, uh, and we invited people to say if there were other Asian markets that were of particular interest to them. So the initial findings, uh, very wide variation. So that's disappointing for a couple of reasons. One is, you know, that in itself puts people off if you're not sure what kind of service you're going to get. Um, it also suggests that, in general, we're not very good at 
uh, delivering on the commitments inside the Schengen Visa Code, which are increasingly uh, designed to make sure that the variation in performance is, is, is limited and people are essentially operating in a similar way uh, across the block. Um, from a, in terms of what should we do to make things better, there was very strong support for more digitalization, both in the process and the visa itself. And that's that's good news in the sense that that's, that's the direction the EC is heading. Um, it's very clear that because of the nature of the process and the requirements, people either choose not to apply in the first place or they abandon during the process. So, and it's those people that official statistics never find. So official visa statistics are only about the people who are, were granted a visa or refused a visa and the number of applications. Official statistics do not catch the people who are deterred from applying in the first place. An agent might tell them, you know what, Australia is easy. Uh, why don't you go there instead? Because they've got a commission-based financial model and they need to make a sale. They're not interested in someone who has to cancel in two months time. That's still quite a big risk. We do know that people will go on other international trips. It's not that they stay at home, very sad that they can't go to Schengen Europe or the UK and Ireland. They are still traveling internationally. So Europe is missing out. What is the impact? Well, Europe is losing export revenue. And, and it's the illustration of that, which will form the, the main bulk of our work in the new year. Uh, and in general, it is causing Europe reputational and competitive loss. So I'm going to show some screens with a bit more detail. And again, we will be sharing this. So don't worry if you can't see everything. I know if you're looking on small screens, some of this will be hard. So the, each column is a country. So it's all 26 Schengen states plus the UK and Ireland. And what you will notice, there's an orange line across which is the, the median result. A country for whom everybody thought that their visa processing was very good or good would score 100. So the best in Schengen and the best in Europe that we surveyed is just over 60, and that's Switzerland. The average is below 35, or it's around 35. That's not good. Um, so this is, this, is, this is something that Europe has probably fallen back on. Um, there are going to be questions to do with where does the money come from. It's usually the case that it's a foreign office budget, foreign ministry budget that covers the cost of visa processing. Um, we would say that it should be treated as an investment because you're going to drive export revenue if you are good at your facilitation. But the people who are sort of counting the value of the visitor economy and not the people who own the budget for visa processing in source markets, that will continue to be a political sticking point. I'd like to draw attention to a couple of things on here, which will make more sense of the next two slides. So just to take Germany as an example, which is a little to the right hand side of the center, a little bit below average, whereas if you look in the next slide where the percentage is very good or good, Germany does reasonably well. It's fourth. Again, it's a fairly disappointing result for Europe overall, but Germany is number four there. So you think, well, OK, Germany's doing not so bad, just under 50 percent a rating Germany's processing very good or good. Uh, but if you look at the next slide, uh, Germany is really not doing so well because it's third in the country's for whom respondents say their processing is poor or very poor. So that illustrates the variation in a very clear case that Germany's got people who think they're good and Germany's got people who think they're poor and everything in between. So it's the lack of consistency, which is one of the most startling findings from this. So what are the issues? And the main issue is that people have to wait too long and business is lost because of the delay. I mean, that's that's, that's clear, but some more specifics and particularly for first time applicants, and that's in order of the significance. So the type of supporting documents, that's problematic. The requirement to present in person is the next most problematic. The window within which you can make the application. So it'd be nicer if it was earlier and that late applications were possible. I'll come to that in a second. It's the cost of getting the visa 
in terms of having to go to another city to, to present, to, to give your biometrics. Uh, and the least important issue, still an issue, but it's the least important is the cost of the visa itself. And just digging into the type of supporting documents, it's the type of proof needed that's complicated, the most difficult being the financial status. And in the past, we've come across this accommodation details. And we know perfectly well people are providing fake proof of accommodation. So you make a booking, you present that evidence with your visa application, and then you cancel the booking. It's a largely pointless exercise, uh, and we should probably get rid of it. Priorities for improvement. Uh, so again, in order of perceived impact, more digitalization, allow later application, um, make it easier to provide biometrics, earlier applications, and more use of local language, although that wasn't a very significant point. And in terms of actual product range, multiple entry visas would be popular, uh, as would you know things that people pay more for but get better service. So that really echoes my earlier point that we should treat this as an investment. Uh, it's an area of uh, each receiving country's service economy, and we need to do a lot better. That is the end of this presentation. So I'll stop sharing my, oh, hang on, it's not. There's one more slide. I do beg your pardon, I was rushing. Um, the deterrent effect for China only, you can see there, was that the if they don't get the visa they want, they will visit a non-European international destination. Um, and next, most likely, is that they'll visit a European country that's outside Schengen or UK and Ireland. Then you can see the rest. And for the general response, uh, and this is the last one I'll show, if they did not apply for a visa at all, uh, what they're most likely to do is go on a long haul holiday. So not domestic, it's still long haul. And if they abandon an application, um, it's still likely, the most likely option that they'll go long haul, but more of them are taking uh, regional holidays as well. So people are still traveling, they're just not traveling to the countries whose visa processing we were surveying. More on this to come. Thank you very much for listening to that. Um, let me see if I can just quickly rush through and then stop sharing. That's it. End of visa uh, processing presentation. Um, if you've got questions, we're happy to take those offline as you wish. Uh, so if you can handle any direct direct you to various emails, but it's now time to turn over to uh, my colleague, Simon, um, and our very valued guest, Marie-Yves Albertelli. Uh, Marie-Yves uh, is really wearing two hats. Uh, she's she's uh, in Paris and she works with the Airports Council International, ACI, Europe, uh, but she's also the rapporteur uh, for the, um, uh, come on, if I can get this right, the European Task Force on, on Border Control. So she'll give us more information both in terms of Paris specifically, but the more broader European policy context. Simon follows all of this very closely. I will now turn over to his very capable hands uh, and I'll keep an eye on the questions. Thank you. Over to you, Simon. And good afternoon, everyone. Um, so today we're gonna explain the, the kind of three new systems, but uh, we'll break it down uh, and we'll just explain that all this information is on our new LIC website, which I'm gonna share now. Um, so please don't rush uh, write down everything because we're going to cover a lot of content today. So the hopefully you'll see this shortly. So uh, for those uh, that are hopefully familiar with our website, um, if you're not sure how to find this this kind of new web page, uh, if you go to policy at the top of the navigation bar, uh, and it's the third one down. So um, if you're not sure uh, how how to navigate to the page. Um, what we've done with the web page again is cover these new formalities but also give a more of a general uh, understanding about traveling to the schengen area and also uk and ireland so we'll just explain quickly uh, kind of recent news uh, and we'll explain a bit more about um kind of maybe some developments regarding the enlargement of the schengen area in a moment um, But again we just do a slight intro um Regarding COVID formalities, we know a lot of you have been looking at our kind of our database that we do have of web links. Uh, this is now moved from the COVID resources page to this page. So 
please have a look um, if, if you're not sure regarding, just double check. Um, I understand that there is no um, certification required at the moment uh, to, to arrive into any um, Schengen or EU or UK um, country, but we always recommend just to double check just before you travel. Uh, and all the links are in here to the government pages, as well as NTO pages and DMOs regarding particularly face coverings that might still be needed in destination regarding public transport. Uh, and then secondly, the Schengen area, again, we've just listed who requires a visa, who, who is uh, weighed for a visa, and also as well, we include the kind of national um, kind of exemptions. But this is particularly for school trips. So we know a lot of members have been asking us about this. Um, now, coming from the UK, particularly, uh, you can arrive into about 11 or 12 Schengen countries still on the kind of list of travellers kind of scheme. So uh, if you've got any questions on this, please, please ask. Um, and, and we highlight later on that the list of travellers does not apply going to the UK. So the UK has withdrawn list of travellers, but it's on a country by country basis regarding UK into uh, Schengen particularly. So um, we just explained a bit more about so, Simon, trends. sorry, can I yeah. just interrupt with a, with a practical thing? It appears that for some people that the chat function may not be working. So if you have any questions, please use the Q&A function and both myself and Sophie will monitor that. So use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen if you've got questions. Oh, back to you, Simon. Thank you. OK, so the new formalities were explained shortly here. Um, and so just say here's Ireland and UK and we will cover travelling between particularly Northern Ireland and Ireland as well, uh, shortly at the end of the, the presentation. So that really is the outlook of the new page. So please have a look after um, this webinar has finished. Um, so first of all, we explain about the new formality, which is the entry exit system. Um, now this is an automated IT system that's gonna be applicable to all third country nationals. So that's where uh, nationals which are not in the EU or not part of EFTA. EFTA is um, Iceland, Norway, Liechtenstein, and Switzerland. And uh, now this is planned to be operational from the end of May next year. Uh, we'll be exploring this shortly a bit more regarding if there's any potential for uh, delays on this. Um, we will highlight that, that this applies to short stays. So this is short stay visitor, so uh, up to 90 days in the rolling 180 day period. And it's both visa exempt and, and visa requiring nationals that will be uh, let, subject to this new system. And now this will apply into all Schengen area countries as well as Bulgaria and Romania. However, there are, um, there's gonna be a council vote in a couple of weeks regarding the enlargement of the Schengen area. And this includes Croatia. So if that was uh, approved by the council, and uh, now the, it has been recommended by the European Commission as well as the Parliament that Croatia do join the Schengen area. As a result, if Croatia do join, then they would be subject to um, entry exit system as well. If they're not approved, Bulgaria and Romania will still join the entry exit system. Now that's a key point because the 90 days in 180 spent in Bulgaria and Romania will count from then in the Schengen area. So, so that's just a key point that we have highlighted in the additional information section below. Um, so the system itself, uh, we'll discuss now with Marie Eve regarding this, uh, kind of breaking down into two sections. So first of all, we'll talk about the, the travel documentation and the effect of this. And then secondly, regarding the collection of the biometric data that will be required. So, so firstly, on the travel document itself, uh, passports will no longer be stamped, uh, which is obviously a welcome development, particularly for frequent uh, visitors to the uh, Schengen area. Uh, and also it will enable use of e-gates where that is uh, allowed or where there's sufficient capacity. Um, now, Marie, would uh, a traveller still have to see a border official once they uh, go past the, the e-gate? Um. When they pass the uh, ABC gates, no, most probably they won't have to, because as you just said, with the EES, the passport will be automatically stamped. As a matter of fact, um, the, with the EES, we will create 
an individual passenger, um, uh, passenger file within the new central system, entry exit central system, uh, European shared central system. So every time a passenger comes for the first time into the Schengen area, whatever the, the um, border uh, um, crossing point might be, being a, um, an airport, a port, a, a road, whatever, at the border, we will create an individual file in the European Central System with the passport information and some biometrics information. And then whenever that passenger leaves the Schengen area, we will create an exit file with um, passport information and biometrics reconciled with the individual file. And then when the passenger re-enters, we will create a re-entry file with um, also passport and, and uh, biometrics information. These exit file, re-entry file, are related to the um, to the passenger um, uh, individual um, um, registration in the central system. And the system will compute how long the passenger has been staying within Schengen. And this will allow to remove, to replace the, the manual stamping. So this is why, because you register your um, third country nationals every time they enter Schengen, every time they exit Schengen, then you do no longer need to physically stamp the, the passport. Yeah, thank you, Marie. Um, so we just explain a bit more about the biometrics kind of required now. Uh, we have highlighted on the page the kind of the age kind of range, but can you explain a bit more regarding the process regarding uh, how, how that's applicable to children and also regarding when you arrive back into the Schengen area, what kind of data is, is collected? So um, as, as we just mentioned, when the passenger, the third country nationals enters Schengen for the first time, you have to create for that passenger an individual file in the central system with passport information and biometrics. You have to create that file with both face image biometrics and fingerprints biometrics. Um, there is no age limit for the face image, uh, yet there is a limit um, of 12 years old for uh, fingerprints. So indeed, for every third country nationals coming to Europe, uh, to the Schengen area on a short stay, that is without a long uh, stay permit, we will, uh, um, we will have to create this file in the central system, even though they are children, even though they're um, very small babies, the, this file will have to be created both with passport information, biometrics, biographic information, and biometrics information, face image as a minimum. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so regarding re-entry into Schengen, say within three years, does the a passenger or traveller have to take fingerprints and facial imagery again, or can they take one or the other? So when the passenger has come to Europe for the first time, the uh, the um, initial file, complete file with pass with the passport information and both biometrics has been created. This file is valid for um, three years and actually for a maximum of 10 years. Every time the passenger re-enters, the period of three years starts again. So when your passenger has come to Europe um, for a first time, then they exit Europe and when they, re they come again to Europe, they re-enter Europe, a re-entry file is going to be created with just one biometrics, either the face image or, or fingerprints, just to reconcile with this the the in the um, passenger complete file, just to check that we're talking about the same person. 
just to reconcile the identity of the passenger. That's the end, the, the purpose. Uh, so uh, you absolutely right. When a passenger re-enters several times, he will not have to create the, indi the individual passenger file again, only an exit file and uh, an exit record and a re-entry record will have, have to be created. Yeah, and if I can just jump in, because we had a question from uh, uh, Sabine, thank you for your question, who wanted to know whether in practice, do I have to scan my face and do fingerprints every time? And I think Marie-Yves, you've just answered that. The answer is no, uh, you don't, uh, because you, you've got that data is already there and it should get picked up when you come back through. So hopefully I've answered that correctly, Marie-Yves. Yes, on the first time you had to take both, but when you you come again, you only have to take one biometrics to reconcile the identity of the passenger. Great, thank you. Um, so I know it's been raised in advance. Uh, thank you for the questions which have been uh, raised uh, regarding the kind of potential phasing in of this kind of uh, system for third country nationals. Now the regulation doesn't allow a phasing in so it affects all uh, third country nationals at the same time um now regarding the kind of start date so this has been postponed twice predominantly for covid uh reasons but it's currently set to take place end of may 2023 uh, now from your discussions with the commission uh do you think this potentially might be uh, postponed uh if not uh regarding the kind of uh we, we're going to end of May, will there be sort of a collection of data will be at the border or can it be done uh, in advance? Actually, the, reg the regulation provides that the go live of the system, the entry into operation of the new system will take place when every member state is ready. So has uh, provided the, um, the uh, European Commission with their um, declaration of readiness. So when one country is not ready, the system can be postponed again. Now, no country as we speak is currently saying that they will not be ready. The go live date uh, is expected, as you said, in May uh, 2023. We, as the industry, have uh, been uh, indicating the European Commission that going live just before the summer season was a big risk, was probably not the best time. There will be some transition period and there, was, there will be an additional workload for the, for the border guards and, and uh, and undertaking this this um, uh, workload just during the um, summer season when we're trying to have more passengers coming to Europe, as you uh, indicated earlier, uh, may not be the best idea for, for the go live date to be postponed after the summer 2023. As we speak, We've not yet been heard on that one. And the position of the DG Home, still um, the um, uh, General uh, Directorate um, for Home Affairs at the Commission, still is go live on May 2023. There will be a, um, a council of the ministers of, on the 8th and 9th of December. And this topic more in a few weeks' time now. Great, thank you. So, um, yeah, just slightly broken up there on my side. So just to repeat that, yeah, we expect uh, some more information, say, around the 8th and 9th of December at the council meeting. That's the same meeting that the, the discussions have got, we've got um, enlarging the Schengen area will take place. Um, Regarding the, we've had a member ask, can the kind of collection take place uh, away from the border uh, regarding the fingerprints and, and facial imagery 
or does it have to take place uh, it, it, with some border officials? Um, the the pros actually the regulation states what has to happen ha what uh, controls have to be undertaken by each and every member state, but the the regulation does not state how it has to be undertaken, and it is up to every member state to decide on the process for their country and for as a matter of fact for each and every of their border crossing point. This is why the actual process will differ from one country to the other, from one border to the other. And you will have some um, automation, some automated process in some border crossing points, and you will have some complete manual process in other um, uh, borders because the, um, the, the traffic mix does not justify to, to do otherwise. So yes, in many border crossing points, the passengers will have to go to the border guard and the border guard will have to conduct all these additional controls. And if I, if I could just jump in, because I, I know we've got to move on to the SES now, but there are just a couple of questions that have come up and, and I'll respond to one quickly and leave one for Marie-Yves and Simon. I think it's been covered. So there's a question of, you know, in practice, how long does the process take, you know, the submission of biometrics and passport data? And in a way, Marie-Yves, I think you've just answered it. It depends on the infrastructure in place at the particular border. Some might be highly automated and sophisticated. Some will be a bit more manual. So um, I, I think it's one of those things where we will learn as things go along at, you know, how quickly... Um, and, and what sort of equipment is in use at each individual border, but there's no requirement for precisely the same kit in, in each uh, border entry. The other uh, question related to Gibraltar, um, it's important, but it's probably beyond the scope of, of this session. Uh, I do know that the, the website that the uh, anonymous attendee uh, quoted, it's not, it's not actually an official website, etias.info is is a private website. It, it's not uh, something that the European Commission produce. So do have a look on our website for the official websites. So Simon, let's let's move on to ETIAS. Thank you for a very, very valuable introduction to EES. Yes, uh, and thank you, Tim. And just to say, if you want to see the official websites, they are at the bottom, uh, so just highlighted here. So please look at that for more information uh, and send us questions. Um, so ETIAS is just below, I say on our website. Uh, and we explain a bit more. So again, this affects uh, third country nationals, but this is the uh, nationals which have a visa waiver to, to enter Schengen. So particularly this will be uh, Japanese, um, US, uh, Canada, and of course the UK as well. And now this is planned to be operational uh, November next year. Now this requires, similar to a US ESTA, uh, this required to be uh, applied for in advance. Uh, the application uh, is not um, yet live, so but it will expect it to be either on a website or through your mobile phone that you'll be able to apply for an ETIAS. Uh, a question has been uh, asked previously regarding can group applications be made? Uh, the answer is no, it has to be done by each individual traveler because it's linked to your passport. So if you lose your passport or it was stolen, in uh, the country of destination, you need to apply for another um, ETIAS. Now, regarding a, exemptions, we have kind of lift, list, uh, listed them here. Just one particular one to note is, is on Ireland. So, uh, so if you're resident in Ireland uh, and you're third country national, you're not exempt from ETIAS unless you're British national who were resident in Ireland before uh, 2021. So, but again, we, we have highlighted the exemptions there. Regarding the ETS itself, regarding countries, uh, again, slightly larger than the entry exits as it stands. So uh, it's quite, um, Cyprus, for instance, will not be implementing entry exit system, but they will be applicable um, for ETS. So when ETS is issued, you'll be allowed to travel to all the countries included. So Schengen plus the, these extra four as it stands. Um, regarding cost, uh, now 
regarding kind of lots of lobbying from Etoa and other in the industry, it has been set to cover kind of admin fee level. So it's not used for promotion. Uh, so the fee is seven euros or expected to be seven euros. Uh, and as you can see, if you're under 18 or over 70, you will not need to uh, pay that fee, but you still need to apply for an ETIAS. Now, a tour operator can apply on behalf of the traveller. However, particularly in the case of children, they need to be, uh, say, the parent or the legal guardian to apply on, on their behalf. Um, and just a final point on school children, as I was saying earlier about the list of travellers. So if, if that school child was applicable, then they will um, be subject to, to ETIAS. So they won't need a, a visa like before, but they will need uh, an ETIAS to, to the country. Simon, so, can I suggest you just move yeah. on to the ETIAS bit of the web page? I don't know if, sorry, the, my, yeah. my, sorry, it is open. I'm just being stupid reading it wrong, but um, okay. that's it, the, the bottom line's up. Thank you very much. That's it, brilliant, yeah. Bye -bye. So if you want to know if you're subject to, to ETIAS as a national, so we've highlighted Annex 2, but also the official website uh, down below. Uh, again, this is where you'll be able to apply, just list the countries. I think there are about 60 uh, countries. So, um, so as you can see, it will, it's probably be referred to as, as as kind of an EU, particularly in the media. But Ireland is not implementing ETIAS, but all the other countries are including, of course, the the EFTA uh, states as well. So, uh, so Marie Eve, regarding the kind of uh, obligation of the transport carrier, how will this be kind of checked in advance that the the person has applied for an ETIAS? Sorry, I, I couldn't hear the beginning of your question. Okay, sorry. Yeah, so regarding the kind of so the transport carrier has to verify that the traveller has an ETIAS. So regarding what kind of collection will that be taken? Will it just be a simple tick? Uh, will this need to be done? Uh, well, before checking, of course, but how, how will the, the, the carrier kind of check? And I know a question has been asked about can it be done, uh, say, within a few minutes if they forget? Uh, now, the answer is yes, most applications will be done within 96 hours. It can take up to 30 days, though. So um, but applications should take about kind of five to 10 minutes. So, um, yeah, so regarding the verification, so what to the carrier, what information um, will they have? How will this be kind of checked? Yes, the carriers will have access to a careers interface which have which has been developed by uh, eu lisa the european agency for uh, uh, shared it systems um, they can use a system to system interface so they have they can have an interface they can have actually their um, online checking system interface through to the european system to check on the ATS and as well on the EES status, and they will get as an answer, okay, not okay, not applicable. And they can also have, they can also um, uh, log on to a website to do this, and they can also use a web application. So these are different uh, devices EU Lisa has developed for the carriers and their service providers for them to check on the EES and ATS status of the passenger before they actually um, check them in or board them. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, ATS is interfaced with EES and will go live six months after EES goes live. So um, maybe just one point to, to stress, because perhaps not everyone's aware, and I, I think you know one of our other partners, uh, you know, Airlines for Europe, would also be saying the same thing as as well as our colleagues at um, at the airports. Carriers do have liability, don't they, Marie Eve? So it is the case that in it's very important that for for the carriers that even if they're using third party gate staff and so forth that they, there is a very big burden to make sure that the technology is working properly, that people are trained properly in order that the checks can be done and people are not accidentally boarded who 
uh, do not actually have, have the correct credentials. So if you'd like to comment on that, and, and one of the reasons why this is difficult and expensive uh, is, you know, does flow mm -hmm. from the fact it is, it is the carriers who, who are going to get into trouble if they board the wrong people. You're absolutely right. If the pass, if the carriers um, 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 brings into a European a Schengen border a passenger who is not allowed to enter Schengen, then the the carrier will have to take that passenger back to uh, initial um, 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 not this. Um, uh, port, let's say, and they would also have a fine. They will. You're absolutely right. They will be liable for this uh, for this lack of checking. It happens actually today every day when uh, when a carrier brings in a passenger at the border who has no passport, for instance, so they cannot enter uh, Europe. Then the uh, the carrier. Um, uh, bears the responsibility, the liability, and they get a fine. The same, the exact same will apply with ATS, except that they will have to go through those IT systems to check on the passenger status. Very clear. Um, Simon, I think now we could we could move on to, to the very specific example um, of, of Paris. So oh, back back to you. Yes, yeah, so just uh, just one final point on ETIAS. So as you can see, the validity there is three years and it will allow uh, multiple entry uh, as well, um, unless your passport it will expire. Uh, and so the normal passport rules um, apply regarding uh, validity. So yes, yeah, so as Tim was saying, Marie, so obviously these are two massive kind of uh, formalities coming in uh, next year. How is kind of the Paris airports preparing for this? Um, Paris airports are, re are actually, yes, indeed, preparing for the enter into operation of ES in particular, just like every airport in Europe. And this is why with the ACI Europe uh, Task Force, we're working on it. At Paris, we are, well, in France, as a matter of fact, we are going to use some um, pre-register kiosks, some border kiosks, that uh, the um, the member state that the the country the the state has bought, these kiosks will allow the passenger to um, initiate his border control before they actually go to a counter to a manual booth. So the passenger will have to go to a kiosk to um, to undertake a few operations and then go to a, um, a manual booth for the border guard to um, complete the, con the border control. Um, there will not be kiosks everywhere in France. There will be kiosks at a number of, of uh, border crossing points. At the airports, at Paris airports, we are going to have a, um, over 300 of those kiosks. Um, on, um, uh, on our borders, different borders. And the, um, we are currently preparing um, the, uh, the infrastructure for those kiosks. And we're also preparing the adapting the manual booths because um, the um, biometrics will have to be taken also at the manual booth. It just, they will be able to undertake the entire control at the manual booth and for some happy few they will be able to use abc gates after they've used the kiosks but once again this applies only to third country nationals in short stay um, of course um, european nationals uh, are not subject to the eeas and will continue to um, to um, uh, experience the border control process that they currently know, S um, such as um, uh, third country nationals in with um, a stay permit, of course. Great, thank you. So, um, is, is, Tim, is there any questions on EES or ETS we haven't covered before we move to the UK? 
There are some questions which I think are covered on the website. So we've got, you know, minimum age. Um, I think you've covered minimum age. Um, uh, uh, obligations on carriers, I think we've covered. Uh, questions as to whether DCS providers are, are, are some of the stakeholders. My understanding is that the stakeholder engagement has been quite broad. I mean, Marie-Yves uh, speaks on behalf of airports, but certainly the airlines as well, and, and other technology companies, whether they're the GDSs, DCSs, or whoever, I'm sure have had an opportunity to input this. As Simon has said, this has taken, uh, there's, there's been a pause due to the pandemic. So, I mean, Marie-Yves, if, if you want to comment on what's been going on behind the scenes in terms of the, the uh, you know, the, the great compromise engine that is Brussels legislation in terms of, you know, can we get this done? You know, can we bring everyone with us? Uh, please do. But I, I think getting into the regulatory uh, detail is probably going to be beyond the scope of this. Um, I think we've covered all in general the, 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 the questions that have been answered. So, Simon, I suggest move on to the next piece. Thank you. OK, thanks, Tim. So uh, so we'll move on to UK. Uh, so, uh, so again, we have information here on certainly on travel and kind of common visa policy where it applies in, in between Ireland and the UK. Uh, but we're going to focus more on, again, the, the kind of the a similar scheme to ESTA and ETIAS, which the UK um, are expected to introduce. Um, now, the, the kind of introduction date, we're still waiting for confirmation on this. Uh, we do know that the UK government would like to have this fully operational before 2025. Um, the policy paper in July uh, indicated that this potentially may start uh, in March of next year through to July for, um, for Middle East countries which have, uh, so which require an electronic visa waiver. So there's, I think, six or seven member states. The majority of, of visa exempt UK nationals, uh, so uh, UK visa exempt nationals, particularly in uh, instance, the, the EU, excluding Irish, uh, as well as US, uh, Japan, again, uh, this potentially could happen from June next year. Uh, but again, we're waiting for confirmation uh, from the UK government regarding the, the rollout um, of ETA. Now, an ETA will apply uh, arriving into all nations of the UK. Uh, regarding Northern Ireland, this will also apply. And again, if you're arriving from Ireland into Northern Ireland, you would, would require uh, an ETA even though there are no border controls between Ireland and Northern Ireland. Um, regarding the, the cost um, of an ETA, the UK government have said it would be similar to, to worldwide schemes, so uh, approximately between six to 20 pound. Uh, and again, we expect it to be multi-year validity. We're not sure how long. Um, entering the UK, a uh, visitor can stay up for up to six months um, anyway. So uh, regarding the kind of uh, process to apply, uh, we expect it to again be a kind of using a mobile or web uh, and they, they, they also will require facial uh, biometric as well where, when applying for an ETA. So we will uh, um, announce more details as, as they're known, um, but the whole purpose um, of an ETA is really to start um, say automating the, the uh, border control a lot more by the UK government. So I explain a bit more about EU ID cards because we know this gets raised uh, a lot to us um, by members. So uh, UK government are, are, are still um, not changing their policy on EU ID cards. So visitors to the UK, alleged visitors to the UK will require um, a passport. Uh, if you're in Northern Ireland arriving from Ireland, you don't need a passport but you will need a passport if you arrive directly into Northern Ireland or onto uh, Great Britain. Um, there's been a lot of lobbying uh, by industry regarding uh, changing this policy um, uh, and particularly for school children. So uh, we know uh, that the market has been decimated by the passport requirement uh, and the latest uh, survey uh, a couple of weeks ago highlighted that compared to 2019 uh, visitors, uh, students um, to the UK has dropped by 89% uh, this year compared to 2019. 
this has been submitted to the Home Office uh, on this, uh, and also as well the list of travellers regarding the uh, uh, UK visa required school children who live in the EU and EFTA, because the UK don't uh, allow any uh, visa waiver. So um, th there is a lot of lobbying going on, but again, the UK government have not changed their policy uh, and they would like to see more automation going forward, particularly uh, reducing the age that um, children can use e-gates potentially from 12 to 10, accompanied by an adult. So um, please uh, keep feeding your information to us on, on the impact of the EU ID card um, no longer being accepted. We will can pass it through uh, to UK government. There is a lot of lobbying going on. Um, but as of now, a passport was st is still required um, into the UK. Um, is there any questions that have been raised, Tim? Yeah, yes. Um, not, not necessarily on, on the uh, acceptance of EU ID cards by the UK. There, there are a couple of others. But, but before we go to the questions, I think just to add to what Simon says, um, economic impact of all of this is very clear and, and that that's true of the 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 piece that I introduced at the beginning of this session you know if people don't find it easy to go to the UK anymore they will go to other places they won't just stay at home and be sad um, so it, it really is a very direct loss of export revenue if facilitation is poor um, so just to get into the specifics and there's some couple of very good questions and Marie-Yves uh, uh, as well as Simon may, may be the experts on this. So Chris asks us, what happens if someone holds two third country passports? So let's say someone has got a US passport and a UK passport. Um, thinking about the, and neither of those countries require a visa to visit Schengen, but both will require ETIAS. So the question is, would the ETS apply to the passport or to the individual? So either of you would like to jump on that. So Marie-Yves, you're smiling. I think that one's come up before. What, what's the answer? Yes. Um, actually, the ETS uh, applies to the person, just like the visa. The, um, uh, in the, the um, ETS is interface with EES, and within the EES, you will register all passport the, pas the passenger has. So if the passenger comes with the US passport and then comes with the UK passport, both will be recorded there. So the ATS will be related to the individual file in the EES with the two uh, related passports associated to it. That's very clear, thank you. And, and also uh, just to keep you in the spotlight, Marie-Yves, um, just thinking about you know, how the, the various stakeholders are, are planning ahead. Um, we know in the context of the EU's departure from, uh, sorry, the, the UK's departure from the European Union, um, there were various projections made of the additional time it would take for uh, the, the checks at the border, which were previously unnecessary due to, um, you know, all being part of the single market. Similarly, um, there will presumably have been simulations and checks to see you know how long will it take if the flight has got you know half the people who are first time you know how long is it going to take to process people on arrival what what sort of work has been done to sort of simulate what the effect on people flow through the airport uh, will be as a result of these news new 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 uh, requirements and, and i guess in some cases there may eventually be an improvement because they're not any longer having to get a physical stamp out and find an empty spot on the passport and stamp it. So some things could speed up, particularly for repeat visitors. But how have you gone about in Paris airport trying to simulate what changes there would be? And, and has that given you enough information to set expectations that it will take you know, X minutes per per flight, you know, is this information that airlines are feeding out to their clients as well? So people maybe are getting to airports a bit earlier, et cetera, et cetera. So, so how have you gone about the simulation and what advice have you given industry? There is no single 
answer to your question, because as we said earlier, the process will be different from each and every member state and even in each and every um, border crossing point. So, but, but, in, but in ADP's so We all have been itself. working indeed at trying to assess, we've been trying to assess the impact together with the, with the the Ministry of Interior, based, of the, based on the assumptions they have, uh, yet all these have to be um, um, uh, to be um, um, assessed, I should say, through tests that we need to be undertake to be undertaking with uh, real passengers with the equipment. We've been trying to improve the elements, the equipment they've provided. But um, yes, with the process um, currently being put in place in France, using the kiosk will be faster than much faster than not using the kiosk. But it would still take more time than uh, than what was what is happening now before we have EES. There is still room for improvement there, and we are working on it very hard. I can tell you with the Ministry of the Interior. We will probably go there step by step. Right. Well, I, I think we're getting to the end of the questions. We're also getting to the end of our time. Um, I, I'll I'll say out loud an answer to a, a question I was halfway through typing, um, and this is from Rachel, who's asking about the initial presentation whether we have any data on people choosing alternative destinations due to visa costs or processing. Um, the answer is yes, and that's exactly, uh, in a way, the purpose of, of, of the exercise we're doing. Uh, if you have a look on our website, you can see in respect of China and India in 2018, and we published that data in 2019. I think it's important to stress that a lot of this has to be based on intelligent assumptions, because uh, as, as I was saying earlier, people are um, reluctant to make um personal complaints about this because they don't want to be sort of tagged as someone who's a troublemaker uh, if they might want a visa in future or as a company they want to continue to apply for visas from a particular consular authority. So the data we're getting is from, for example, the people who are selling holidays and we're just asking them, saying, okay, if people having finally understood what the implications are and the requirements are for applying for a visa, and then they decide not to go to Schengen or UK Ireland, what do they do then? Now, those travel agents or B2C operators themselves might not conduct scientific surveys, they will just have a general idea. So all we're doing is collecting the aggregate general ideas, but the results of it, uh, it's an apples apples comparison across across the response is quite startling. And what's clear now versus previously is the appetite to travel internationally and long haul is still strong. And that's in a situation where long haul flights are much more expensive, relatively speaking, than they were. So it's definitely a very big economic loss. And that's going to be uh, one of the main elements of, of the work we publish in, in the new year. So let me have a, another quick scan of the questions as we have um, a minute or so uh, uh, to go. Uh, quick one, uh, Simon or Marie-Yves, are there, is there any sort of provision for exemptions around ETIAS for um, people who've got to cross borders or extended multi-country trips? I think the answer to that is no, but tell me if there are any exemptions to ETIAS. If, if you're a, my understanding is if you come from a visa waiver country, you must participate in the scheme. There is no option. Is that correct? My understanding is, is yes, but we will uh, say I recommend to look at the official uh, commission webpage. So again, just highlight where ETS is on our webpage uh, and, and in below. So, but we would stress if you are Googling for the page, please put European Commission ETS. Uh, just quickly, I'll show you what it looks like. This is the, the page. So please look at this page. There are some other pages uh, online, uh, but this should hopefully give you some information regarding how to apply and, and particularly the FAQs because they're quite comprehensive. Thank you very much, Simon. I, I think we, we have now run out of time. Um, so I think for the other questions, I, I would encourage you to 
have a look at the website. We will be doing more on this. I notice that people are curious to know more about the proposed UK ETA. We will definitely be publishing more information on that as we have it, and particularly as it affects travel within the island of Ireland. So thank you very much to all of you for staying with us for the hour. Marie-Yves Albertelli, thank you so much for your expertise and time today. Uh, and I look forward to uh, learning more how the rollout takes place next year, but thank you. Uh, Simon, over to you, that's me done. Yes, uh, thanks very much. And uh, just to highlight, we have got a policy newsletter uh, being sent next week. Um, if you're a member and you've got any questions, just by all means, anytime, please send to us uh, and we'll try to help you answering them.